Well, uh, that's one way to start. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the youth ministry director here, and I also oversee our uh, Grow and Connect ministries. I uh, am not typically up here on Sunday mornings. Our lead pastor, Todd Malone, is, is our usual preacher as well, and uh, he and his wife are on vacation in Oregon right now. They'll be back next week, so uh, look forward to seeing them back here again. Today I'll be preaching the 15th message in our Unity in Action series, which is a series where we've gone through the entire book of Ephesians, and we're almost to the end of our journey. We're in the last chapter and the uh, next to last message in the book of Ephesians. A well-known quote came to my mind while I was studying this passage, and uh, so I looked it up for two reasons. One, to make sure that I read it correctly and accurately, and secondly, to make sure that it was correctly attributed because, as you know, a lot of times uh, historical figures are credited with saying something that they didn't really say. Like, you'll see memes that say, uh, you can't trust everything you see on the internet, and the quote is attributed to Abraham Lincoln, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but in this case, it did turn out to be accurate, and uh, this is a quote from a man who actually probably would have been forgotten by history if he had not come up with this brilliant and insightful phrase. So we'll go ahead and put it on screen. Uh, the man is Lord Acton, is, is what he's known as, Lord Acton, and here's his famous quote along with a few sentences he added to explain it. Power tends to corrupt... And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence and not authority. Still more when you super add the tendency of the certainty of corruption by authority. Power tends to corrupt and, corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. An insightful statement about human nature. Whenever a sinful human has authority, it is his tendency to want to abuse that authority for selfish ends. Think for a second about the situation in Washington, D.C. right now. <laughs> what am I going to say next? <laughs> that. Uh, so uh, President Trump has been impeached by the uh, House of Representatives, and so now he's going on trial before the United States Senate. And uh, the reason he was impeached is that congressional Democrats accuse him of abusing his power, of abusing his authority. And then on the other side of the aisle, Republicans accuse the congressional Democrats of abusing their authority by impeaching the president in the first place. And that kind of story is going to be repeated until Christ returns, because sinful humans tend to abuse authority. And I, I don't know which side is correct in this, and I don't even know if we'll ever know, uh, short of heaven, but uh, that's where we are. It's, it's a living example of the abuse of authority from one side or the other. <clears throat> and because of humanity's experience of the abuse of authority, or I should say our experience of the abuse of authority, feeds into another sinful tendency we have, and that is to reject authority. Naturally, we don't like other people telling us what to do. Well, today's passage, as you probably noticed, is about authority, how believers should relate to authority, whether they're under authority or whether they're in authority. Paul addresses authority in the home, which is the place where you first experience authority when you come into this world. <clears throat> and like last week's passage, today's scripture does have a controversial section, and I'll address that when I get to verse 5. So uh, let's do this. Let's review just quickly what Ephesians is all about. The first three chapters of Ephesians tell us what God has done, and the last three chapters tell the Ephesians what they are to do, and by extension, us as well. Today, we're in the Build Unified Households section, where Paul gives instructions to the different members of a first century household. Now, the title of this series is Unity in Action, because unity is one of the overarching themes of the book of Ephesians. In the very first chapter... Paul reveals that God's purpose in this universe is to unite all things in Christ. And then throughout the book, he touches on that theme of unity several times. For instance, Jews and Gentiles are united as one people under Christ. All people are united together under Christ. So in the church, we are all united to one another. And then when he gets to the household, he's going to talk a bit about how we can live under the unity of Christ in the relationships that we experience in our household and like I say, that's a specific instance, but in general, it's really touching on the issue of authority. There are four primary commands 
in this passage that Paul, because Paul is addressing four groups of people. So we'll just look at each one in turn. The first one is this. Children should obey their parents. Children should obey their parents. I am told that especially Dalton Heiko needs to hear this. <laughs> Look at verses 1 through 3. Again, uh, it says this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So God's main command to children is that they obey their parents. He addresses the children directly so we can safely assume that he's talking to people that were old enough to understand what he was saying. However, I discovered that the term children actually can be used of adults. It's often used in scripture as a generic term for a person's offspring. And we do that today as well. If somebody asked me how many children I have, I wouldn't say I have two children and one adult. I would say I have three children even though my oldest son recently turned 18, so he is uh, considered an adult. <clears throat> and he is stronger than I am. <laughs> so what are the limits of this obedience that he is commanding? If he's talking about children, meaning little children all the way up through adult children, what are the limits? Well, remember that these verses are addressing the members of a household. So I think that right there defines the limit of that term, of that command to be obedient. In other words, even if you are an adult, if you are living under the authority of your parents, if you're living in their household or, or living on their support, then you are still under their authority. But when you, as an adult, move out of the home and you're supporting yourself, you're now independent, you're establishing your own household. So that is the place that you would have authority over and your parents would not have authority over that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So once you move out and you're providing for yourself, I don't believe that the scripture is, is requiring you to obey your parents. I don't, mean, I don't mean to say that you can disregard your parents, of course, but it's no longer a sin for an independent adult to go against the wishes of his parents, while it would be the sin of a child living under his parents' household to go against his parents' will. He, he mentions that uh, you should obey your parents in the Lord. So as, as with the duty of the wife to submit to her husband, the duty of a child to obey is limited by the greater authority of Christ. You do not have to obey your parents if they are leading you into sin. You do not have to submit to your parents if they are abusing you. That is not something that you submit to because that would be uh, basically joining in on their sin. <clears throat> the command is modified by the phrase, in the Lord. So you and your parents, you obey your parents in the Lord. Obeying them is a way of obeying the Lord. The reason children should obey is because it is right. Which is a very straightforward statement that Paul gives. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It is a righteous thing. It pleases God. You are doing the will of God. You should obey your parents because it is a righteous thing, a righteous thing to do. It brings glory to God and contributes to harmony and unity in your house. Now, to amplify this statement, obey your parents in the Lord, Paul then adds the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. Obedience honors your parents because obedience is an act of giving respect to the authority of your parents. And the command to honor your parents actually is not based on independence. So even if you are an independent adult living on your own, you are still required by God to give honor to your parents even though you're no longer required to submit to their, uh, to their wishes. Now, I realize that that raises some thorny questions regarding honoring a parent. If you had a parent or two that abandoned you or that, the, or that, that were abusive, and I don't have any easy answers for those specific instances, but uh, one suggestion I did read about would be to pray for them, to pray for God to save them and bring them to himself and shape them into the image of Christ. Now, as an added encouragement to honor parents, Paul points out that this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now, that doesn't guarantee that someone who's a, who is honoring their parents will necessarily live a long life, but it is a general promise that your life will be better and that it will be longer if you honor your parents, if you honor your father and mother. It's also a reminder of our unrighteousness. 
Because you and I and every person on earth does not obey our par- did not obey our parents when we were living under them all the time. And even now, we don't always honor our parents. It's what you should aim for, but you know that we all fall short of that. But thanks be to God, our Savior Jesus always obeyed and always honored his parents. Luke 2 mentions that Jesus was submissive to his parents. And if anyone ever had the excuse that he knew more than his parents... That was Jesus. He literally knew more than his parents, and yet he submitted to them while he was living under their household. And his righteous record of obedience is credited to you when you put your faith in him. So children obeying your parents is the first command he gives to the household. He wants to see unity in the household. He wants to see the righteousness of Christ displayed, and that begins with the, with the children. Then he moves on to address parents. The second command is parents should nourish their children. Look at verse 4 again. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, verse 4 is specifically addressed to fathers, since the father is the head of the home and the one ultimately responsible to see that the household is operating according to the way God wants it to operate. But this this, uh, command would apply to both parents because, of course, mothers and fathers are both Intimately involved in raising children. Now he begins this way. Parents are given a negative command. Do not provoke your children to anger. The NIV says do not exasperate your children. God is telling parents to avoid words and actions that unnecessarily stir up anger in their children. Here are some things to avoid. Severe discipline. Unreasonable demands. Arbitrary or inconsistent rules. Constant criticism. Or humiliation. Now I know by experience that it is very hard to be a parent. I know it is one of the most difficult jobs on earth. But all of you parents think back for a minute to when you were a kid. It is also hard to be a kid. To live under the authority of someone else. To have very little control over what direction your life takes. Sometimes no control over your haircut or what you wear even. And then that I know that's a good thing uh, for some kids as well. Uh, So the point Paul is making is do not make it harder for your child to obey by stirring up anger and resentment in them. So treat them in a Christ-like way so that it is is easier for them to obey so they're not living in this constant state of agitation and anger. If you realize that you've been exasperating your kids, confess that to the Lord and ask his forgiveness. Then confess that to your kids and ask their forgiveness. Now, instead of provoking kids, the positive command is bring them up in the uh, discipline and instruction of the Lord. And that word, the, the, the verb bring up, can also be translated as nourish. And it actually was just earlier in this chapter, uh, in the last chapter, 5 verse 29. Parents should nourish their children by bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Your job as a parent is to help your kids grow. And uh, years ago, when I was in premarital counseling with Jim Johnson at this church, one of the metaphors he gave my wife and I for our marriage relationship <clears throat> that was aimed more toward me was the metaphor of the tomato plant. And he said, you're, you're, uh, think of your wife kind of, that does sound weird now that I say it out loud, think of your wife like a tomato plant. But anyway, uh, so I think... <laughs> Maybe he was saying your relationship. Anyway, so you've got this tomato plant, and if it's not growing, you don't scream at it. You don't slap it around. You don't criticize it. You make sure there there are not any bugs that are attacking it. You make sure that you feed it, and you water it, and it gets enough sunlight. (laughs) Pardon me. It gets enough sunlight. You nourish the plant to help it grow. So God is saying the same thing applies to parents and children. You are to nourish your children. So your goal is not to intimidate. Your goal is not to batter them into submission. Your goal is to feed and and nourish them into health, to lead them into being an adult. Your job as a Christian parent, of course, is to help your children to grow into adults that fear the Lord. You bring them up and you nourish them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now that means that you teach them about the Lord. You read scripture to them. You pray with them. You help them to know who Jesus is And what he's done. None of us can make our kids come to faith in Christ. What God tells us to do is train and instruct them in the Lord. To basically give them the atmosphere and environment of the truth of God. Which is one of the reasons that being part of a local church is so healthy and so 
necessary because you are surrounding them with other adults that know and love the Lord and they are growing up in an atmosphere of the faith. You can do this also through what's called family worship where you gather as a family and you read the Bible, you pray, you maybe sing. And you can find lots of resources online for that. You can do this through bringing God's truth into everyday conversations and interactions with your kids. However you do it, as a parent, you are charged with pouring the truth of God into the lives of your kids, nourishing them, making sure that they are as healthy as possible. And recognize that you will fail at this. You'll sometimes provoke your children. You will sometimes neglect to nourish them in God's truth. But in Christ, there is forgiveness and grace. You're accepted by the Father because of the redeeming work of Jesus and not how well you're doing as a parent. Look at these verses to see what you should be aiming for, what you should be pursuing, how you should be living, but recognize that that is not the basis of your acceptance with God. The basis is the redeeming work of Christ. Look to Jesus to rest in his love and acceptance. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And what did, how did Jesus do with these commands? Because Jesus, of course, acts somewhat as a parent to us. He's an authority over us. We're required to obey him as children are required to obey their parents. Does Jesus provoke us to anger? No, of course not. Jesus, Jesus nourishes us. Jesus gives us discipline and instruction. And his discipline isn't severe. It's perfectly suited to our need and it's for our good so that we may share in his holiness. Jesus doesn't give us arbitrary or inconsistent rules, and he never treats us spitefully. Everything he does is loving us perfectly, nourishing us with perfection. In Christ, children should obey their parents, and parents should nourish their children. And by the power of God, we can do that however imperfectly we pursue it. The third command is the controversial part. Bond servants should obey their masters. Look at verses 5 through 8 again. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Now, I use the word bond servants in my point even though the ESV translated this as slaves. The translation is correct. That is the most accurate translation of that Greek word, is slaves. The reason I used bond servants is because I wanted to highlight the fact that slavery as an institution in the first century is different than the slavery that you and I are most familiar with that was practiced in the United States in the uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. When you and I hear the word slave, we think of the slavery of a particular race of people, and we think of the bondage and abuse that was perpetrated upon them. We think of the families that are torn apart. We think about the war that, that was uh, sparked as a result of that. <clears throat> but slavery in the first century Roman Empire was a bit different. For one thing, it was not based upon your skin color. It had nothing to do with your race. There were people of all different nations that were involved in this, uh, that were slaves, excuse me. Slaves were often highly trained and well-educated. They were used as tutors. Sometimes they were used as physicians. They would be set in, in charge of large portions of a, a person's household or business. And probably the most important difference is that, the mo that most, the majority of slaves in the Roman Empire could anticipate being freed by the age of 30. And they had three or four different channels by which you could get your freedom. So that's the backdrop for what Paul is instructing slaves about. So I don't want you to look at that merely as, man, I can't imagine he would tell somebody to just submit meekly under that, under that kind of abuse, because he is not picturing what we're picturing, the slavery that was practiced in the United States. Now, although it is true that Paul does not call for the abolition of slavery, and no New Testament writer does, it is also true that the very ethic and practice of the Christian faith undermined the institution of slavery, even as it was practiced back then. For instance, in Galatians 3, Paul said, Believers are all sons of God. There is neither slave nor free. So one thing that was taught is that in Christ, a slave and a freeman 
were on an equal footing. They were both one in Christ. In Romans 3, Paul said that all have sinned and all are justified by God's grace. So a master and a slave both were sinners in need of the grace of God. The practice of the equality of believers worked directly against the view that some people are less valuable than others. A believing slave was just as much a participant in public worship as a believing slave owner. Worshiping together, singing together, serving together, and learning the word of God together would naturally tend to cause masters to see their servants as equal image bearers of God. And Paul told these slaves, these bond servants, to obey their earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Now, again, because of our emotional connotations with the word slavery, when we see that he's supposed to obey with fear and trembling, we think, what in the world is going on? You're supposed to be in, in fear of your master. But that phrase is referring to deep respect, similar to the attitude that a wife should have with her husband. It's not fear of being harmed. It's not fear of being hurt, hurt but it is a deep respect, the fear that comes from, I, I acknowledge and revere your office or your position. <clears throat> so Paul is saying that you should serve your masters with deep respect for their position. They are in a position of authority over you. He also mentions that they should serve with a sincere heart as they would Christ. A slave's act of submission to his master was an act of submission to Christ, ultimately. His service should be sincere, meaning that their motive in obedience is to serve their masters and not just to look good in their master's eyes. They shouldn't be people pleasers, aiming for eye service, as he puts it, but they should be God pleasers. The goal of their service is to please and glorify God. And he tells them that actually they are working for the Lord and not just for men. And he adds that the Lord will reward them for the good they do. Well, I realize, or I hope, I shouldn't say realize, I hope that no one in this building is literally a slave. Because that is not legal in this country anymore. Praise be to God. So because of that, it's easy to think, well, those verses really don't have any application to me because I'm not a slave. Well, of course, you know I'm going to say that they do anyway. That's my job. The closest thing that we have to the master-servant, I'll use that term, I guess, to help the emotional uh, attachment taken out of it. The closest thing that we have is the employer-employee relationship. Now, you'll often hear sermons where this is applied directly to employees and employers and say, you know, this is kind of like what Paul is talking about. But let's recognize there was still a huge difference between an employee today and a slave back then. For one thing, whatever job you're working at, you can quit any time. A slave was not free to quit. And a slave was not free to just necessarily mind his own business, buy his own home, pursue his own family. He was at the beck and call of his master. So there are some huge gaps between these. But ultimately, all that Paul refers to, all that Paul says to slaves does apply to someone under authority to anyone else. When you are under an authority, this is how you should act. This is how you should live in Christ. In fact, how much more should we be willing to give our best to please and glorify God, to serve our, our employer with sincerity and with purpose, when we know that we're not being forced into that work like these people were? So think about some authorities in your life, your teacher, your coach, your government, our obedience to these earthly authorities is an act of obedience to the Lord. We should render service to them with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. And there's another way that these verses apply directly to us, and that is in a spiritual sense. Because Paul mentions that these slaves are actually slaves of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. You and I and every believer on earth is literally a slave to Christ. We are completely under his authority. So we should obey Jesus with the deepest reverence and from the heart and not just for show. He's the master who gave his life for us and actually deserves our complete obedience. Out of gratitude for what he's done for us, we should joyfully serve Christ with our whole being. And when you fail to do that, when you disobey, when you, see him, when you serve him half-heartedly, confess your sin and receive his forgiveness and grace. Now let's look briefly at the last command in this passage. Masters should treat their servants well. Read verse 9 one more time. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. <clears throat> 
The last person addressed in this household code is the master of the bond servant. And by the way, there are at least two or three ways just in the order of this passage that Paul was undermining the typical ideas of that day. For one thing, you would not have addressed slaves or children if you were talking to the duties of a household. You would only address the master. You would only address the father. So by Paul even addressing children and addressing slaves, he's showing that they are independent moral agents, valuable in the sight of God. And then the fact that he mentions the lesser person in authority before the, the uh, greater person in authority shows that he's caring a little bit more, kind of preferring the person who's on the lower end of the scale. So when he talks to masters, which would typically be, of course, the husband and the father of the previous verses, Paul recognizes that these people wielded a lot of power. In Roman law, there were a lot, there were, there were not many bounds to the power of a husband and a father over their wives, over their children, and over their slaves. <clears throat> so Paul is going to constrain what they do by the Spirit of God, by his commands, to show them that they should not exercise that power in ungodly, wise, ungodly ways. He wants masters to know that they do not have free reign even over their slaves. There are God-given limits to their authority. And the primary command is do the same to them. Now, this is fascinating that he started this way because he had just mentioned all these things that slaves should do. Serve with sincerity. Serve as to the Lord. Don't be a man pleaser. Serve, uh, excuse me, not just for show. Do it with all your heart, knowing you're going to receive a reward from the Lord. And then he says, masters, you do the same thing to them. Now, he doesn't mean, of course, that masters should obey their slaves because that wouldn't work if the master told the slave to go clean the barn and the slave told, turned around and told the master to go clean the barn. Nobody's going to clean the barn, right? So there is an authority structure that's still in place. But he is telling the masters that just as servants have a duty before Christ to serve them in a way that is godly and loving, masters have a duty before Christ to treat their slaves in a way that is godly and loving. He's telling that they need to act toward their bond servants in the same way that their bond servants act toward them, with a sincere heart, as servants of Christ, doing the will of God. And then he adds, stop your threatening. Now, you and I would naturally be repulsed by someone who would beat another human, as was practiced, of course, with masters and slaves. And, beyond, and Paul goes beyond that. He doesn't just say, don't physically harm your slaves. He's saying, don't even threaten them with physical harm. Do not use the threat of physical harm in order to get them to obey you. You put that away. And he finishes his instructions with a warning. Knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Your master, who is ultimately the master of that slave as well, is in heaven. And he does not judge with partiality. He is above you and he doesn't have two standards of justice. One for the masters and one for the slaves. He isn't partial to masters because they have a higher position in society. And just as God isn't partial to rich people or attractive people or smart people or athletic people, he isn't partial to powerful people. Trust your serv excuse me, treat your servants well because God, your master in heaven, cares about how you treat them. And he doesn't wink at injustice. Now, since we don't have any slaves in the congregation, I will assume as well that we do not have any masters in the congregation. But... Almost everyone in this room at one point or another in their life will exercise authority over another human being. <clears throat> so I think these, this verse is a good thing to take with you regardless of what position of authority you're in to remind you of how you're supposed to treat those who are below you in authority. In uh, Matthew 20, 25 to 26, as I mentioned last week, Jesus says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Our exercise of authority should not be self-serving or heavy-handed. Jesus, the Lord of the universe, showed humility and grace over those who were under him. He loved and served them. The most vivid example of that being at the Last Supper when Jesus knelt on the ground and washed the dirty feet of his disciples. He demonstrated what it looks like as a master to bless and serve those under you. So if you are in authority today as a parent, 
as a teacher, as a boss, as a coach. It behooves you before God to treat those under you with love and respect and care. Not heavy-handed, not intimidating, not threatening. Don't throw your weight around to show everyone you're in charge. Treat them well with sincerity, doing the will of God in the way that you lead them. So here's one way that I would summarize the lesson that we should learn from these verses. Believers should follow Jesus' example in the way he submitted to and exercised authority. Even though Jesus was the Lord of the universe when he humbled himself to take the form of a man and live on this earth, he submitted to the authorities that were above him. His parents at one time, the government at another time. And even though he is Lord of all and can demand and Anything he wants, he alone in the universe could throw his weight around. He treats us with love and care and kindness in his authority over us. So whether you're over or under authority, our aim should be to follow the example of Christ, who submitted to authority in humility and exercised authority with love. But I don't want to leave you with just a command. So let's hear a gospel word. I found another fantastic quote from this uh, pastor I recently discovered, Kim Riddlebarger, and he said this. Because Jesus loves us, because Jesus gave himself up for us and sanctifies us, because he cleansed us, and because he presents us to the Father as his bride, we are therefore to follow Paul's household code as a matter of thanksgiving for all that Christ has done for us. We do not do these things because we can fulfill the law's demands. Rather, we obey these commands because in Christ, God already sees us as obedient and righteous. Children obey their parents, slaves submit to their masters, parents nourish their children, masters treat their servants well, because Jesus has already fulfilled God's commands perfectly. We obey these commands because we are grateful to God for all that Christ has done for us. Amen. We should follow Jesus' example in the way he submitted to and exercised authority. That should be what we aim for, recognizes that we won't, recognizing that we won't perfectly follow his example and resting in our faith in him even when we don't. How can you apply this message? How should you respond? Well, there are some pretty obvious ways right from the passage. For instance, if you're a teenager, Dalton Heiko, if, <laughs> if you're a teenager, think about the things you do to disobey your parents that they aren't aware of. Confess that to the Lord, receive his forgiveness, and ask for his help to stop doing it. Fathers and mothers, ask your children if there are things that you do that provoke them to anger that you need to stop doing. Confess that to the Lord, receive his forgiveness, and ask for his help to stop doing it. Employees, consider your work ethic. Are you working sincerely and with purpose as to the Lord, not just for show? And employers, authority figures, are you treating those under you with kindness, with love, and with respect? Are you serving them as you would serve the Lord? You'll find a few more suggested responses in your bulletin or sermon notes and up on the screen behind me. The Christian faith is meant to be lived, not just studied. That's why we suggest responses to God's word every week. And God's goal in revealing your sin is not just to make you feel badly about yourself. His goal is to make you more like his son. Our submission to authority and our exercise of authority should reflect the character of Christ. And when you fail on either side of authority, remember that your failure, your sin, doesn't determine your status before God. Your status is based upon your faith in Christ, who perfectly obeyed, who perfectly submitted, who perfectly exercises submission. All who believe in him are beloved children, and you can rest in that. Let's all stand. I'm going to pray in just a moment to conclude the message, and I'll ask the prayer team to come forward as I'm praying. There are going to be, as always, people in front of the stage at the end of the service. So if you don't know the Lord, if you're far from the Lord, if you're struggling with any problem that you would like prayer about, there'll be men and women up here that would be delighted to pray with you and for you. Let's go to God. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, the victorious Son of God, I come before you and I thank you, Lord, for even this passage of Scripture, which, which rubs against some of our sensibilities and makes us somewhat uncomfortable. Thank you for revealing, Lord God, that your desire is for us to submit to the authorities that you have established with humility and with grace and out of love for you, not out of love for the authority, but out of love for you, oh God. 
and that your desire for us is to exercise authority in a godly way like Jesus did with concern and care for those who are underneath us. God, I pray that you would bless us to pursue that in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, resting in your grace, knowing that when we fail you, we still stand before you as beloved children because of the work and person of Christ. Lord, I ask for a special measure of grace on all who are here this morning. May you be honored in your people. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.